The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fourth chapter of Acts. Excuse me, Acts chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 32 through 35 there. And as you're turning, you may look to your right or left and notice somebody who was here last week and here this week. Feel free to tell them we do this every Sunday, (laughs) not just on Easter. So, but Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. We'll read through verse 35. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, Holy Spirit, we pray that you are with us and speak to us. For, Lord, if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And, Lord, if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. So be with us, God. Speak to us through the words of Holy Scripture. We may hear you calling us more and more into the selfless, loving work of your holy kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What do you do with Easter when it's over? What do you do with Easter when it's over? Now, of course, Easter isn't technically over. You've probably heard me say this before. Easter is actually a season that begins with Resurrection Sunday and extends for 50 days to Pentecost. But still, for most folks, Easter was only last Sunday. It's over. So what do you do with Easter when it's over? I mean, it's not like Thanksgiving, right? When Thanksgiving is over, you put it in a Tupperware container, stick it on a shelf in the refrigerator, maybe behind the milk. When Thanksgiving is over, you can wrap it in aluminum foil, make a week's worth of turkey sandwiches out of it, maybe have chicken and dressing and green bean casserole a few nights later for dinner, right? You sweep up the crumbs, you put away the dishes, and you start thinking about, what's that football game usually comes on the Saturday after Thanksgiving? I know none of you watch it. Thanksgiving is over. That's what you do. But what do you do with Easter when Easter's over? It'd be nice if it was more like Christmas. When Christmas is over, you just take it down and box it up. I mean, sure, there's some variation on exactly when Christmas is over. For some of us, it's about 9 a.m. Christmas morning. After the last kid has unwrapped the last box, they've all passed out on the floor. Better get these balls off the tree before they wake up, right? Starts right at the end. My mama used to say, you had to wait till after New Year's. But how long after New Year's sort of depended on how energetic you were to take the tree down. Sometimes after New Year's was March. Sometimes after New Year's never came. I think when they hauled my mom's old trailer away, there were still a few remnants of Christmas lights hanging on the cornice we nailed there 15 years ago. Still, there are those who are more liturgically pure who say, well, Christmas is 12 days long, and so they don't put anything away until Epiphany, January 6th. Either way, when Christmas is over, you haul it out by the road, you put it back in its box, you take it off the door, you take it out the windows, you take it down from the mantel, you put it back in the basement, back in the attic, or out in the garage. When Christmas is over, you put it away with Mary, Joseph, Shepherd, the Magi, the little baby Jesus, all back in their little styrofoam boxes. But what do you do with Easter when it's over? Maybe you hang it back in the closet 
next to the suits you wear and save for funerals. Maybe you shove it all in in a cookie jar, hoping your kids will forget about it, right along with those chalky little chocolate footballs that somehow never seem to all go away. Or maybe you tuck it back in the file folder of your memory, right along with the smell of vinegar and food coloring, the taste of boiled eggs and that weird texture of yellow-colored sugar on marshmallow peeps. Maybe. Maybe you put it back in its place so you'll know right where it is come next year. You can pull it down, dust it off, remind yourself and everyone who sees you that you still have it. But what do you do with Easter when it's over? Every year I tend to think about what it must have been like for those first followers of Jesus Those first folks who had to answer such a question. I mean, we know when Easter's coming. We know on Friday Easter's coming, but they didn't. What do they do with Easter when it's over? Right after it happened. Do you think they slept well Easter Sunday night? Jesus is back from the dead. Well, it's about 9.30. Better get ready for bed. I'll deal with this in the morning. Do you think they went to work? The next day. How'd that conversation go on the phone? Uh, Boss, I'm sorry, but I can't come in. Turns out my friend who I thought was dead is back alive, and I may not be coming back in at all. What'd they do? Did they run down to all the synagogues, knock on the rabbi office door, just to tell them, guess what, Jack, you missed it. You got it all wrong. He's back. Did they march up to the palace of Pontius Pilate, swords in hand, Demand the liberation of their people because guess what, man? You tried to kill him, but he ain't dead. Did they reignite a spark of self-righteous piety? Did they stand on the street corners calling down everybody who passed by for not believing and acknowledging the anointed nature of Jesus and his ministry? Did they publish their experiences hoping someone would come calling, wanting to buy the movie rights? After all, it isn't every day you run into somebody who knows somebody who came back from the dead, at least not legitimately, right? What did they do with Easter when it was over? Mark, like we saw last week, sort of leaves us in the dark. Only tells us that the women fled the tomb out of fear. But to read that, we know that's not right. After all, they had to tell somebody they ran away scared. But then Matthew, Matthew tells us that the disciples did eventually return to Galilee where they worshipped Jesus. And Jesus gave them what we Baptists are sort of known for, the Great Commission. And then John, John gives us a touch more with stories about Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene, the other disciples, and then this fascinating thing in chapter 21 on the beaches of Lake Tiberias where Jesus cooks breakfast for his disciples, has this odd little conversation with Peter, and even stirs up a rumor about the immortality of the beloved disciple. But it's Luke's account that we're interested in this morning. You see, in Luke, the resurrected Jesus appears to the women at the tomb, two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and to the rest of his disciples before he ascends into heaven. But Luke doesn't end his story there. Luke's a good screenwriter. He's got a sequel. We call it the Acts of the Apostles, or just Acts for short. Now, now in Acts, if you want to ask the question, what do you do with Easter when it's over, you're going to get some pretty amazing answers. I mean, for starters, there's this whole scene in chapter 2 at Pentecost. The disciples with a newly minted member to replace Judas are gathered together in one place when this violent, rushing wind comes in, bringing with it divided tongues as a fire, Luke says. It's the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And it's this arrival of the Spirit of God that enables all of those gathered for the festival of Pentecost to hear the disciples' words in their own language. And they say, are they drunk? In fact, Peter is so empowered by the arrival of the Spirit that he delivers a sermon right there on the spot. And it's like a Billy Graham crusade. The Bible says 3,000 people were added and baptized to the number of the followers of Jesus. The first movement, in fact, of Acts mostly focuses on Peter's empowered actions, accompanied often by John, 
We hear in, in chapter 3 about how Peter heals this blind beggar. He sees Peter and John. Peter stops in the middle, makes eye contact with him and says, Gold and silver I do not have, but what I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, get up! And he gets up and walks. And then in chapter 4, we hear about how they have to answer for it. How Peter and John stand before the council. How they have to defend their actions for proclaiming the gospel. By chapter 5, we hear all about their miraculous healings. How they're healing all kinds of folks of all kinds of things. In fact, in fact, if one were to read the whole book of Acts, one might get the impression that the answer to the question, what do you do with Easter when it's over, that the answer would be, well, you preach, you heal, you perform miracles. There is, however a subtler answer that lies in Luke's words and acts. An answer that may not pack the punch of a miracle story we've told and retold during vacation Bible school, but an answer that holds power, great power, to even change the world. There are hints of this power laced throughout all of the opening chapters of Luke's second volume. One such hint comes at the end of chapter 2. Luke writes these words. He says, All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. Now that sounds great, but go back and read it. Two chapters in. What works? What signs? What wonders have the apostles done? There's no accounting of them. Luke doesn't tell us. Or has he? Because maybe the wonders and signs are what Luke writes immediately following that verse. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And then Luke says, And day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Isn't that something? He doesn't say they went out and moved mountains. He doesn't say, even yet, he doesn't say they went out and cured the sick. He said they just shared what they had. Could it be that the great power of the apostles, the wonders and signs that were being done by the apostles, that that great power was found in this communal way of life? Could it be that the power to change the world is found more in the sharing of what we have? The breaking and eating of bread together. The making sure everyone has what they need than it is in the miraculous healings and acts of wonder. I don't know. But Luke throws a few more hints our way in chapter 5. It's a scary story about a couple, a husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, and they're struck dead. Why are they struck dead? Why do they suddenly succumb to the shock of death? Was it because they had some wrong teaching that they were out preaching to everybody? No. Was it because of some lack of faithful attendance? Did they miss Sunday school too many times? No. Did they fail a Bible quiz? No. Did they fail to appear for a prayer meeting? No. They were struck dead, Luke says, because they sold a piece of property and kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. In other words, this husband and wife had committed the grave error of holding something back for themselves, of hoarding and hiding something that would have been beneficial for others. And so, they're dead. I don't know about you, but that makes me a little nervous. Could it be that the greater grievance of God is not found in the theological and interpretive arguments that we love to have, but in the everyday ignorance of the needs of those around us and the ways in which we hold on to that which isn't ours in the first place? And then there's this text before us this morning. The text that really sets the stage for the whole scene about Ananias and Sapphira. 
Now, we might be tempted to single out just verse 33 as the proof text, the theme of the passage. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Because after all, that sentence sounds good. It sounds like something we want to read in the Bible. The apostles giving their testimonies with great power. But that's not the whole story. In fact, that verse is smack dab in the middle of our passage this morning. Luke tells us, Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possession, but everything that was owned was held in common. And then he says, With great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And then he says, He doesn't start a new chapter. He doesn't end the letter. He doesn't say moving right along. Right away he says, There was not a needy person among them, For as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Could it be that the power of the apostles' testimony was found in the very way they lived their lives? Together. Could it be that the great power of Christ's followers is found not in empirical might, not in cultural dominance, not in miracle management, but in the very act of placing the needs of others ahead of ourselves? You know, that might be the very thing that could change the world. That sort of power may be exactly what it takes to turn this whole thing right side up. After all, arguing about stuff doesn't get us anywhere. I love what Philip Yancey, an evangelical author, once wrote. He said, no one was ever converted to Christianity because they lost the argument. That needs to be like in needlepoint on everybody's couch on a pillow somewhere, right? No, arguing won't get us anywhere. And and I'm sorry, I almost hesitate to say this because I I know you'll probably shut me off when I say it. But neither will miracles. I know, I know that may be of a sort of a shock to you, but it's true. The world is just too skeptical. Folks are just too ready with an explanation, a way to disprove whatever miraculous event we may want to claim as proof of our message. There's a Discovery Channel show about it somewhere. I promise you. But there is, however, one thing that is downright impossible to disprove. One act of great power that cannot be denied or construed. One way of being in this world that can't help but cause others to stop and take notice. And it may even make some of them mad at you. It's that great power found only in Christ to overcome self. To overcome self and be liberated to the resurrection reality that life isn't about what you can get, but about what you can give away. I recently read a quote from Eugene Peterson, a great Presbyterian pastor. He said, the kingdom of self is heavily defended territory. But the power of Easter, the power of Easter's revelation shows us that the kingdom of self is a false one. It's in need of deconstruction. So that we may take hold of God's calling on our lives to selflessly serve others, to give more of ourselves away, to see the needs of those around us as far more important than whatever barriers we place between us and them. Because you know what the light of Easter shows us? There is no them. There is only us. So what do you do with Easter when it's over? Do you put it away? Do you put it in a box? Do you put it in the crisper drawer of the refrigerator? What do you do with Easter when it's over? Well, you take it with you. You take it with you. You take it with you out into the world and you live it for everybody to see. You live into the reality that God has called us, shown us that the way of God's kingdom is one of self-emptying, self-sacrificing love. That the way of God's kingdom is a way of seeing the needs of others and giving all we can in order to meet those needs. That the way of God's kingdom, the way of great power, is found not in our strength, not in correctness, not in our influence, but in the deliberate 
selfless drive to love God and everyone else. And to show that love by meeting the needs of those all around us throughout the world until that day comes when there's no need left and the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness. So what do you do with Easter when it's over? You go live it. Because the truth is, it's never over. It's never over. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to us now as we stand on this side of resurrection morning. As we may be tempted to ask, what do we do with Easter now that it's over? Help us, God, to see the great power you give us in the truth that it is never over. And you are calling us even now to live into its reality. So be with us, Holy Spirit. Move in our presence that we may respond to your calling on our lives, even now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.